There is another one that we failed to mention in our announcement this morning, and that's Sister Linda. She is going to be having surgery scheduled for Tuesday of this week at Pikeville, and hopefully that will take care of everything for her. That will make her third surgery just, just this year in the past few months. So let's remember her. We're glad that you're here today. We've got several who are visiting due to the upcoming holiday. In fact, this week our country is going to celebrate the national holiday of Thanksgiving. What a day that will be. The women are going to get up early. They're going to cook for hours. They're going to set the table with a feast that's going to be fit for a king. And then for about, oh, 20 to 30 minutes, the family's going to stuff themselves more than that poor turkey was. Following dinner, the women are going to clean up the mess. They're going to clear the table. They're going to wash the dishes. They're going to put things back away and fill the refrigerator up with leftovers. The men, on the other hand, will all retire to the living room. And after we get to the living room, there's going to be a burping contest. Some men will loosen their pants because they've now become too tight. We're going to watch TV or we're going to fall into a turkey-induced coma, one of the two. It'll be the day that Macy's Thanksgiving Parade will be on a lot of televisions. And the big thrill of the weekend is going to be able to watch that great and mighty football team, the Ohio State Buckeyes, when they play Maryland. <laughs> That's the first time I've ever been booed when I was preaching. <laughs> history says history says the first Thanksgiving was held somewhere between September 21st and November 11th in the year 1621. And present at that feast were pilgrims and Indians of the Wapanoa tribe. In 1863, then President Abraham Lincoln declared a national day of Thanksgiving to be held each year sometime in November. On October 31st of 1939, then President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed a presidential proclamation that changed the holiday to the next to last Thursday in November, and he did that for business reasons because if you have it at the end of November, then you won't have as much money to spend on Christmas. So he wanted to back it up a little bit so folks could have more money to spend at Christmas. On December 12th of 1941, a joint resolution of Congress changed the National Thanksgiving Day to the fourth Thursday in November. We're not the only ones that celebrate Thanksgiving. There's Canada. Some of the Caribbean countries, Liberia, Australia, and maybe some others. Being thankful for what we have shouldn't be something that we just think about one day a year. We, of all people, ought to be thankful continually. Thankful for the food that we have, for the clothing on our backs, for the shelter that's over our heads, thankful for the comforts that surround us, heat in the winter, air conditioning in the summertime, comfortable furniture to go home and sit in, cozy beds to go to sleep on, telephone to connect us, that can connect us anywhere, no matter where we may be, computers that we can hold in our hand and find out Anything about anything. You know, I couldn't help but think to the youngsters in today's society, 
a computer that you can hold in your hand and find out anything doesn't mean anything. But to those of us who are older, something like that, the very idea of the modern conveniences that we enjoy today, they're mind-boggling, aren't they? How in the world does that thing do what it does? But it does. But we ought to be thankful for that. Certainly, we ought to be thankful for the spiritual blessings that we've been offered through the great grace of Almighty God. We're able to read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 57, the Bible says, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. 2 Corinthians 9.15 Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. There's no way. There's no way that we could ever begin to give enough thanks to the Father of lights from whom all blessings flow. This morning, I want us to look at just a couple of biblical examples of folks who were thankful and why they were thankful. We're going to begin our study on this wonderful morning in 2 Samuel, chapter 11. Springtime had come to the land of Palestine. Winter was over. And the battles which had been going on the year before had been put on hold because the, the weather was bad and they didn't want to be out in the winter weather fighting. Those who had been involved in the fighting in the winter time or, or whenever winter hit had ceased fighting due to the bad weather. Now spring is here and the battles are going to pick up again. They're going to continue. The Bible says that the armies of Israel went out to fight. But King David, the king of Israel at that time, remained in Jerusalem. It was in the evening. David had got up. He had gone to bed, but then he got up and he couldn't sleep. So he goes to the roof of his palace to walk in the cool of the evening. One of the things we need to realize is that the homes in Palestine, in the days of King David, had flat roofs. That is one of the reasons, or I guess that is the reason why, in the laws given by God through Moses to the Israelite, we're able to read one of those laws. And that law says in Deuteronomy 22 and verse 8, God speaking through Moses to the people, he says, when thou buildest a new house, then thou shalt make a battlement for thy roof, that thou bring not blood upon thine house, if any man fall from thence. Even yet today, in many parts of Asia and the Middle East, the homes have flat roofs. Remember, uh, and by the way, there's stairs that lead up to the roof. Remember in Mark chapter 2, Jesus was in the village of Capernaum on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And while he was there, he had been healing people and teaching. And he goes into a house, and there he begins to teach. And people crowd into the house and around the house in order to hear the words of the Master. There were so many people, in fact, listening to our Lord as he taught in that house that whenever people brought a man on a cot who had been paralyzed, they couldn't get into where Jesus was, so Jesus could heal this man. You, you remember what they did? They took the man up to the roof of the house, and they cut a hole in the roof, and then they lowered this poor man who was paralyzed down to where Jesus was. I remember as a child hearing this story, and I was thinking, boy, that'd be a job getting him up on the top of that slanted roof, holding him up there, cutting, but, but that's not the way it was. The roofs were flat. They carried that 
man up on the roof in a cot, cut a hole in the roof, lowered him down to where Jesus was. The Lord healed him. Now, in the evening time, it's cooler up there than it is inside the house. And so without something to block a person's way, you could easily fall off of a flat roof. Walk off of it, fall off of it, the results would be the same. And for that reason, the Israelites were commanded by God to build a battlement, a battlement around the roof of the house. The word battlement is a word that is only found one time in the King James Bible. It is the Hebrew word ma'aka, and it means a low wall at the edge of a roof, or a balcony, or along the sides of a bridge. In other words, it's a berm that's been built there to keep somebody from falling off. Under the law of Moses, if you build a new house, you had to put a wall around the roof. All right, so, so David's up on the roof of his house, this flat roof. And as he's up there, he's able to see a woman who's washing herself. This woman, the Bible says, was beautiful to see. And instead of controlling his desires, David permitted his desires to control him. The king inquired, who is this woman? The Bible doesn't say who told him. It just says that he was told that her name was Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, Uriah was a soldier in the king's army, and he was out fighting for the king. He was out fighting for the king the same time that the king was lusting after this man's wife. David had this beautiful woman brought to him, had a relationship with this married woman. Bathsheba conceived and finally sent word to David, I'm pregnant. The story of what David does next is well known. He sends for Uriah, her husband, to be brought back to Jerusalem from the battle site. And whenever Uriah gets back there, David sits down or, or is there with Uriah and asks him. He wants to know how's the battle going. Are we winning? Are we losing? Have we lost many people? After receiving news from Uriah, David tells this faithful soldier, Uriah, he says, tonight go to your house. Spend the night there. David knows if Uriah goes to his wife, then Uriah is going to think the baby that she's going to have belongs to him. Well, the next morning came. David goes to the door of his house, and guess who he sees? There's Uriah stretched out asleep. He was there with the servants of King David. David wants to know, he says, Uriah, why didn't you go home to your wife? Uriah has an answer for him. Uriah's answer in 2 Samuel 11, 11. Uriah says, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents. And my lord Joab. Now, Joab was the commander of the army of Israel. He says, My lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open field. Shall I then go unto my wife? As thou livest, and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. He says, how in the world could I be comfortable when the army's out there fighting? He says, I can't do this thing. So David has another plan. First one didn't work. David's next plan is this. He says... Well, he gets Uriah drunk. And after Uriah's drunk, David figures he'll go home to his wife. The next morning, guess where Uriah is? He's there at the door of the king's house again, sleeping with the servants. 
So David says, well, I've got plan number three. And here was his third plan. David sends a letter with Uriah back to the battle site from which Uriah had first been called. The letter was sent to Joab, the commander of the army. The letter said this, Put Uriah in the place where the fighting is the worst, and then at the appropriate time have everybody back away from Uriah. And that way it will just be Uriah and the enemy. This was done, Uriah was killed, and news was sent back to David of the death of Uriah. After the proper time of mourning, the king sent for Bathsheba, made her one of his wives, and everything seemed to now be going David's way, seemed like it. He had accomplished his goal. He now could take this man's wife since the man was dead, but we're able to read these words in 2 Samuel eleven twenty-seven. 27. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. We go to the next chapter in 2 Samuel, chapter 12. It is there that Nathan the prophet was sent to David. And he told David a story. And that story had an instructional meaning. Here's the story. Nathan says, David, there were two men. Those two men lived in a city. One of them was rich, had all kinds of flocks. The other one was a poor man. He said, although the rich man had all kinds of flocks, this, this poor man had one little ewe sheep. And he kept that sheep in the house like a pet. Had it there with his family. And, and the Bible says he even considered it or thought of it or loved it as his own daughter. Well, a traveler came to visit the rich man one time, and rather than kill one of his own flock, and he had many, but rather than kill one of his own flock, he took that poor man's lamb, and he killed it in order to furnish food for the traveler. And when David the king heard this, he was absolutely enraged. And he said to Nathan, he said, This man will be put to death for that which he has done. And at this point, Nathan the prophet declares to King David, Thou art the man. God has made you king. God has given you everything that you desired but God says, you have despised me and taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. And then we read in 2 Samuel 25, 13, And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Now you remember how David is described in the book of Acts. He's described there as a man after God's own heart. A man after God's own heart. And yet he considered sin, he, he, he did sins that we would never consider performing. And we think, how could he, a man after God's own heart, be guilty of adultery and murder? The answer is simple. David had the same problem you and I have. He was human. He was. And like any human, he had weaknesses, like we do. And sometimes those weaknesses came forth even when he knew better than to let them come forth. When the gravity of the sin he committed were brought to his attention, David sincerely repented, repented. God is always willing to forgive his children when they sincerely repent of sin. And when he realized that God had forgiven his sin, David then wrote these words in the book of Psalms, beautiful words, Psalms 32, verses 1 and 2. 
David said, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. That word imputeth that's found in the verse, the word imputeth is the Hebrew word cheshab. It means does not charge his account. When David sinned, that sin was written down in the mind of God. When God forgave that sin, it was gone, as though it had never been committed. The slate is clean. But notice the attitude of this man when God had forgiven his sins. He says, this man is blessed. Blessed. The word blessed is the Hebrew word ashan. It means happy. A happy man, listen, a happy man is a thankful man. Thankful because David's iniquity had been totally forgiven by the Lord of hosts. Give me another example of a man who was truly thankful. Our brother, the Apostle Paul. Here's a man who had surely committed sins. You and I wouldn't do or at least that's what we think. He attempted to eradicate the very name of Jesus from the earth. That was when he was called Saul of Tarsus. He had called for the death of a multitude of Christians. But he had received mercy, and he had received forgiveness of sins. And toward the end of the life of this aged child of God, we find the Apostle Paul writing, Writing in 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8, he says, I'm now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I've fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Paul says, when my life's over, I've got a victory. That victory in Jesus. Paul was thankful for that victory in his Lord. In fact, he writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, he says, thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, he said, in everything give thanks. Today you can leave this building with thanksgiving. Being thankful, no longer guilty of sin, because the blood of Jesus has washed those sins away. And when God forgives, God forgives. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5 tells us, describing Jesus, says that Jesus washes us from our sins in his own blood. When are our sins washed away with the blood of Jesus? Well, that's easy. In the book of Acts, chapter 22, verse 16, Ananias the preacher is speaking to this Saul of Tarsus. They're in the city of Damascus. And he tells him, Now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The invitation is given to you. If you're here today and subject to it, if you've never been baptized, for the forgiveness of sins. Listen, your slate has not been wiped clean. It needs to be. It must be if you expect to inherit that wonderful mansion the Lord has gone to prepare. The invitation is yours. We offer it to you. We pray that you'll respond. Won't you come while together we stand and sing?